We are glad to announce the following ministry opportunities and services for all COP members during the current GCQ. Our Fortress 91 is open for a short 15-minute service from Tuesday to Friday at 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturday to Sunday anytime between 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. on all campuses except Pampanga. The COP main campus will have two entrances and venues, the Taft Avenue Lobby, Mezzanine, and the River Room. Each service is limited to nine people per venue. Morning Devotions, our weekday online program, continues Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m., with the evening service streaming every Monday to Thursday at 7 p.m. Our weekend online services begin with the Friday service at 6.30 p.m. You may choose any of the following times to attend the main service. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. Or watch back on YouTube at the time of your choice. Thank you for loving God and loving to be in the services. Please don't hesitate to let us know any way we may serve you further.
We are glad to announce the following ministry opportunities and services for all COP members during the current GCQ. Our Fortress 91 is open for a short 15-minute service from Tuesday to Friday at 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturday to Sunday anytime between 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. on all campuses except Pampanga. The COP main campus will have two entrances and venues, the Taft Avenue Lobby, Mezzanine, and the River Room. Each service is limited to nine people per venue. Morning Devotions, our weekday online program, continues Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m., with the evening service streaming every Monday to Thursday at 7 p.m. Our weekend online services begin with the Friday service at 6.30 p.m. You may choose any of the following times to attend the main service. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. Or watch back on YouTube at the time of your choice. Thank you for loving God and loving to be in the services. Please don't hesitate to let us know any way we may serve you further.
We are glad to announce the following ministry opportunities and services for all COP members during the current GCQ. Our Fortress 91 is open for a short 15-minute service from Tuesday to Friday at 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturday to Sunday anytime between 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. on all campuses except Pampanga. The COP main campus will have two entrances and venues, the Taft Avenue Lobby, Mezzanine, and the River Room. Each service is limited to nine people per venue. Morning Devotions, our weekday online program, continues Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m., with the evening service streaming every Monday to Thursday at 7 p.m. Our weekend online services begin with the Friday service at 6.30 p.m. You may choose any of the following times to attend the main service. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. Or watch back on YouTube at the time of your choice. Thank you for loving God and loving to be in the services. Please don't hesitate to let us know any way we may serve you further.
We are glad to announce the following ministry opportunities and services for all COP members during the current GCQ. Our Fortress 91 is open for a short 15-minute service from Tuesday to Friday at 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturday to Sunday anytime between 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. on all campuses except Pampanga. The COP main campus will have two entrances and venues, the Taft Avenue Lobby, Mezzanine, and the River Room. Each service is limited to nine people per venue. Morning Devotions, our weekday online program, continues Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m., with the evening service streaming every Monday to Thursday at 7 p.m. Our weekend online services begin with the Friday service at 6.30 p.m. You may choose any of the following times to attend the main service. Saturday at 6 p.m., Sunday at 7.30 a.m., 10 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 3 p.m. Or watch back on YouTube at the time of your choice. Thank you for loving God and loving to be in the services. Please don't hesitate to let us know any way we may serve you further.
Hello, hello, and welcome to our COP online evening service. It's been a while since we were doing this kind of an online service on Friday night, but we need to deal with present reality. And you know what the present reality is? He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. That is the present reality. That is always our reality, that God is true, His Word is true. And so we open up our prayer and worship and Friday night teaching service with Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. Amen. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Amen. Tonight, before we go to our worship, I want to read with you three little verses, and let's just talk about it, and let's pray about it. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, it says, It is the Lord who goes before you. Amen. <laughs> it is the Lord who goes before you. He goes before you to that job interview. He goes before you to that quarantine center. He makes sure it's just right for you when you get there. He goes before you if you have to take public transportation. He goes before you. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Another translation says discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Don't fear. He is with you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Another scripture, 1 Chronicles 28, verse 20. Then David said to Solomon his son, Be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, is with you. You know, if God is with us, who can be against us, right? Who can be against us if God is with us? He will not leave you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the Lord is finished. I want you to notice that, that God is with you and these dreams that he has placed in your heart, this business he has given you, this dream for educational goals, these dreams for relationship goals, these dreams that the Lord has given you, it will be finished. It will be done. Don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous and push forward. It says, and do it. Be strong and courageous and do it. Push ahead. Don't let your dreams shrink in size because of current circumstances. The current circumstance is that God is with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. In fact, in the New Testament, Hebrews 13, verse 5, For he has said, 
I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so there you have it. What else do we want greater than that assurance? Our God, the God who created this universe, God has said he will never leave us or forsake us. So lift up your head, lift up your heart, and lift up your hands to the Lord. He is with you. Don't give up on your dreams. Don't be discouraged. He's gone ahead of you. He knows the way, and he will lead you every step of the way through whatever it is you're going through, whether you are losing a job or lost a job or holding on to it, but it's hard to get there, or maybe you were only called to work two days this week or half a day this week. Maybe your relatives are in a quarantine center. Whatever is the situation, don't give up. Don't be discouraged. God, the reality is that your God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Would you allow us to pray together right now? Can we just lift up all of these things to the Lord in prayer? Father, we thank you because your word is true and you will truly never leave us, never forsake us. You are with us. Lord, I pray for all of us tonight that we will not be discouraged, but Lord, our hearts and our eyes will turn to you, our God, our maker, our creator, our promise giver, our promise keeper. Lord, for everyone who needs a job, Lord, let them miraculously find employment. Lord, for those who are not sure if they're going to lose their job, Lord, I pray that they will be that person who is retained in their company. Lord, I pray that you will be with us no matter where we are tonight, in quarantine centers, in public transportation, wherever we are tonight, be with us all, Lord. Be with us. Let your wings cover us and protect us. And we thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let's worship the Lord together.
Before we get into our offering thought, I want to again remind you that we're working very, very hard to try to get something open. Now, we do have Fortress 91 fully functional, um, South, East, Maine, North, and Bulacan. Pampanga is fully open, so you can have all the services you want, and please forgive us, Pampanga, if we envy you a little bit. And I, I don't know why we can't get the permits at South for um, in Las Pinas for the drive-in services this year. We've done it before under uh, ECQ and MECQ, so I don't understand what's different now. Um, but we're working very hard to get all this done. So please forgive me if my frustration is showing just a little bit. We know that you want to be in God's house. We know that you don't want to lose another Easter. We understand and we're doing our very best. Please pray with us that we can have favor and we can get at least some drive-in services going. Now, for our offering thought today, I want to take you back again to what we've been learning. And really, these are not new thoughts. Yes, I've made them bigger and longer and I've studied more and I've learned more. But some of these are the thoughts that I used back in the 80s and 90s when we went through all those downsizing of companies, the retrenchments, the the people losing their jobs during the big economic crisis in the 80s and again in the 90s. And I taught you how to be retainable and promotable. And I've been hearing really good testimonies of our members as their companies even now, even this last week, went through downsizing and our members not only retained their jobs, but they either got salary increases or promotions. So th this is the purpose of this teaching, how to be retainable and promotable. And we said that, that there's three types of employees in every company. There are the people that management is talking about because they're doing so well and they're on their way up. There are people that management are talking about and they're not doing well and they're on their way out. And then there's this large group of invisibles that the management never talks about until times like this. This is when mediocrity will not do. In seasons like this, this is where mediocrity will be destructive to your career and destructive to your family. These are days where we step up and we do our best and we work with all of our heart as unto the Lord. Now, we're right now we're focusing on these people that are the first to go. The first to go are those that are being noticed in the wrong way. And these are the people who bring toxins into a company. We said that toxins do not exist naturally in nature. They are produced by another living organism like red tide. We said lazy people create a toxic environment. Proverbs 10, verse 26, New Living Translation. Lazy people irritate their employers. Now, again, they may not irritate anybody else on staff, but they irritate the people who are responsible to get the work done. They may be nice to everybody else. They may be popular with everybody else, but they're an irritation to the people who have to make decisions. Now, you don't want to be an irritation to somebody who's making decisions about you keeping your job. I mean, you, you don't want that person to notice you in an irritated way. So we said, all right, we don't want to be lazy people. We said that lazy people, first of all, release and develop bad attitudes, these toxins toward leadership in the workplace. Secondly, lazy people create and release deep resentment. And we saw all the reasons for that resentment last weekend. Now I want to take it a step farther. And I want you to see that lazy people are brothers to those who destroy. And this is a toxin in every company. And you'll see why it's so toxic as we go. Proverbs 18, verse 9. Whoever is slack in his work, who's ever lazy in his work, doesn't fulfill his quotas, doesn't get his work done on time, doesn't turn in his reports on time, whatever. Whoever is slack in his work, Proverbs 18, 9, is a brother to him who destroys. Now notice, a lazy person is of the same family as those who destroy. They destroy a family business. They destroy a company. They destroy a sales team. They are part of the destroyer clan. Now, you, you have to get this into your heart because they may be a really nice person. They may have a really nice personality. They, they may be wonderful at getting along with everybody and everybody likes them. They may even be the life of the party. But in truth, they are related to destruction. They are part of the family of destroyers. Now, let me give you five truths why very quickly. Number one, a lazy person is destructive of assets. 
because of their attitude toward maintenance. Let me say that again. A lazy person is destructive of assets because of their attitudes toward maintenance. Proverbs 24, verse 30 and 31. I pass by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was overgrown with thorns, and the ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. See, a lazy person will not maintain what they have. You know, one of the things I look at with people is, you know, a lazy person won't even polish their shoes. <laughs> okay. A lazy person doesn't take care of anything they have. A lazy person, you, you can give them a car to use and they don't maintain it. It's full of scratches. They don't change the oil. Uh, they don't keep it clean inside. You've got bugs and cockroaches inside the car. Ugh. You know, a, a lazy person, whatever asset you give them, they don't maintain it. Now, I'm not talking about someone who accidentally drops a cell phone, okay? I mean, please, all of us are klutzes at times, and we, we drop things. I'm not talking about somebody who makes a mistake with a computer and, and, and breaks a screen. I'm not talking about somebody who, who accidentally spills a cup of coffee on their keyboard. I mean, please, accidents happen. But when you have someone who everything you hand them is destroyed, yeah, you got a lazy person. They won't maintain their own personal equipment. If they won't maintain what belongs to them, like a good way to make an employee decision is go look at their house. Now, folks, please, we may live on a dirt floor, but it could be a clean dirt floor. Okay? We, we may not have much, but what we have is clean and taken care of. Now, you look at a person's home, and you see they don't maintain what they have. They're not going to maintain the equipment of a company also. They're not going to maintain the computers, their desks, their chairs, their cell phones. If they don't care about their own assets, they're not going to care about any of the company equipment that's assigned to them either. They are brother to destroyers. And this is going to be a constant toxic situation in the office because you're always going to have these people wanting more equipment and complaining that they don't have what they need to work with, but they break and they destroy everything they touch. Secondly, a lazy person is not just destructive of assets. A lazy person is destructive of opportunities. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 27. Whoever is slothful will not roast his game, but the diligent man will get precious wealth. Well, let me read that to you from the New Living. Lazy people don't even cook the game they catch, but the diligent make use of everything they find. The diligent make use of everything they find. So we have a comparison contrast here. A lazy person does not value and will not take advantage of an opportunity that's placed right in their hand. Now, anybody who's ever tried to grow a company understands. Anybody who's tried to do sales understands. Opportunities are where growth and blessings come from. But you see, a lazy person just looks at an opportunity as more work. <laughs> I looked at a pastor one time who was lazy and is no longer with us. And I asked him to go and visit this family. And he didn't want to go visit them because they live so far away. I said, but they drive into us every Sunday. I said, you, you could visit them. Well, he would not visit them. So it really irritated me. So I went out and visited that family. I drove all the way out myself. Left 4.30 one morning, drove out and visited them. Was back in the office. I didn't get a lot done that day. I didn't get back in the office until 10.30 or 11 that morning. But it was a long drive, heavy traffic. But the family came every Sunday to be with us. I mean, please, if, if they can drive in every Sunday to be with us, I can go out and visit the family. Well, I went out and visited the family. You have no idea how many people got saved on that day. The relatives that they had waiting the neighbors that they had waiting. It, it was like a mini crusade. When I came back, I called a young man and I said, you know what? You could have had a tremendous harvest of souls. You could have opened four connect groups today. But instead, you know what? You're not going to be the, the district pastor of this area anymore. I said, I gave you an opportunity and you just saw it as work. Now, see, a lazy person never sees joy in opportunity. A lazy person just thinks it's more work to do. So, all right, destructive of assets, 
destructive of opportunities. Thirdly, a lazy person is self-destructive. Proverbs 19.24 The sluggard buries his hand in the dish and will not even bring it back to his mouth. New Living Lazy people take food in their hand but won't even lift it to their <laughs> to their mouth. <laughs> a lazy person will walk into Mung Inasau with eat all you can and they'll get the chicken and rice in their fingers and they won't even pick it back up to their mouth. That's a lazy person. See, a lazy person is destructive to themselves because they won't take care of themselves. Now, if they won't take care of themselves, they don't care about the survival of the company either. And now here's something you really need to get. Because they have no motivation to take care of themselves, reward motivation doesn't mean anything to them. You can promise them bonuses if you get this done, and and they won't do the work. (laughs) Reward motivation does not motivate a lazy person. Fourthly, all right, so we've got destructive of assets, destructive of opportunities, self-destructive. The next one, a lazy person is destructive because they invite a spiritual force called poverty. Proverbs 24, verse 32. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. New Living Translation. Verse 34. Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit and scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. You must understand that poverty is a spiritual force. Just like there are people that are sick because of biological causes, and then they're sick because of spiritual causes. There are people that are poor for reasons, and some of those reasons are spiritual reasons. Poverty is a spiritual force. Poverty is attracted to lazy people. Just like you've often heard me say, faith brings the presence of God, fear invites the attack of Satan. Poverty attacks the lazy. Poverty doesn't attack hardworking people. Poverty is attracted to laziness, and poverty will pounce on you, and scarcity will attack you. Now, when you have lazy people working for you in your company, listen, forgive me, you've got a spiritual force of poverty attacking your company. Wow. The fifth one, very quickly. Lazy people are destructive because they are, they are know-it-all, big mouth, do-nothings. Lazy people are destructive because they are know-it-all, big mouth, do-nothings. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let me read it to you in New Living Translation. Verse 10 and verse 11 and 12. Even while we were working with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Yet we hear some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus to settle down, work, and to earn their living. Now notice, they live idle lives, they refuse to work, and they meddle in other people's business. Lazy people are professional critics. Remember I taught you last weekend, lazy people think they're smarter than everybody else. They're professional critics. They stick their nose in everybody else's business. They criticize what everybody else is doing. They are destructive to team morale because they think they're so superior and they've got a big mouth and they stick their big nose into everybody else's business and that destroys morale. So, all right, I've taught you five things today. I've taught you lazy people are destructive of assets, destructive of opportunities, destructive of their personal life. They invite the spiritual attack of poverty and scarcity, and their know-it-all, big-mouth, do-nothings. These are not people that we want to be. We want to be hard workers in Jesus' name. Amen? All right, would you put your tithe together in the red envelopes, put your seed in the blue envelopes, and no, you cannot come to the altar and bring your offerings. But what you can do is set it aside in a desk drawer, and the next time we have services, you can come and bring those offerings as an act of worship to the Lord. Amen? Say, well, Pastor, why don't you keep pushing us like other churches to give online? Because I've always taught you. I know some people can't, but I've always taught you, if at all possible, you bring the tithe and you bring the seed as an act of worship. Amen? All right, now we've got a great special number for you. Second Francis, one Francis, no matter how many.
many promises God has made. They are yet in Christ. And so the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Let's sing. Amen. 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 It is so. It is so. Amen. 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 It is so. It is so. I promised you I'd be teaching on the prayer life of the Apostle Paul tonight. And I'm not promising you we're going to do a one-hour service tonight, all right? We've been fitting into that little cramp space. And since we're not allowed to meet publicly, can I go just a little bit longer? All right. I want to begin to teach you to pray like the Apostle Paul prayed. We know that Paul was an incredible man of prayer. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26, he said, Likewise, the Spirit helps our weaknesses. For we don't know how to pray as we ought, for the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. So Paul teaches us about this beautiful interrelationship of the Holy Spirit helping us pray. He teaches us that we pray with the Spirit and pray with the understanding. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14 and 15. If I pray with a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what am I to do? I, I pray with my spirit, but I also pray with my mind. Also, I pray, sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. In other words, we sing with the understanding, and we sing in the tongues of the heavenly languages that God gives us, and we pray in those tongues that the Holy Spirit gives us, and we pray with the understanding. Now, now there are, are many Pentecostals that, forgive me, are lazy prayers. They, they'll pray for three hours in tongues. But they won't pray for five minutes with the understanding. Well, your mind is unfruitful. You never know when you've had an answer to prayer. You, you, you miss so much of prayer when you don't learn to pray with the understanding. Now, you know I believe in praying in tongues. Paul said I pray in tongues more than you all. I believe in it. But you need to pray with the understanding also 
so that your mind is fruitful. Paul teaches us to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Now, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about that, and most of it is just, it's an unlivable life that they present. But to me, prayer is listening to God as well as talking to God. Prayer is having a walking around communion with God. I told you about a little book that I got when I was just a very young Christian called Practicing the Presence by a guy named Brother Lawrence. I'm sure if you Google it, it's a free download by PDF. It's a very old little book. And I keep a PDF of it in my, my iBooks reader because from time to time I like to sit on an airplane and read it again. It's, 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 it's a great little book of reminder that God is with us always. And as the book teaches, you can pray while you're washing the pots and pans, you know. And everything that you do, you could be having a relationship with God. It's, it's not just those designated times of prayer. It's, it's keeping a heart open to hear his voice and, and just being with him. Now, the only illustration I can give of it is, you know, like Sister Bev and I have been married for, ye, what, 42, 43, 44 years now? Somewhere in there. She might shoot me when she finds out. I can't remember how many. But we're just comfortable together. And we just like to be together. And sometimes we don't have these big, fascinating conversations. It's just, we're just together and we're saying, we're talking things and I'm singing silly songs to her and she's chuckling because when Sister Bev giggles, she giggles, she giggles in chords. He, 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 he. Okay. And so, you know, she, she, she giggles, you know, in, in, in tune and, you know, it's just this relationship because we've been together for so long. When you hang out with God all the time, yes, you have those special times of sit-down conversations every day. But you also just enjoy hanging out. This is praying without ceasing. Paul teaches us about total seasons of fasting and prayer in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 5. Paul said, don't deprive one another, talk husband and wife, physical, sexual relationship, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time. You don't just say, hey, we're going abstinent now that we're, we're, we're married. He said, for a limited time, that you may devote yourself to prayer and then come back together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And now notice, even as a husband and wife, there are times that we we set aside sexual relationships because it's a, a devoted season for fasting and prayer. Now, there's lots of things I could teach you about the Apostle Paul. I just, I just wanted to throw some of the more familiar things out there to let you understand. This is a man who understood a prayer life. And as I walk you through the next few weeks through his prayer life and how he teaches us to pray, it's important that you understand this is not a man teaching you about prayer, and he doesn't know much except what he read in a book. This is a man who had a prayer life. Like with Jesus, the apostles looked at him after he came out of a season in prayer and said, Lord, teach us to pray. When you're around people that, that pray, you always want to learn from them. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 15. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints... I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the incomparable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now that's Wow. I mean, we could, we could preach for one year on that passage and still not completely explore it. But let me just pull some of the thoughts of prayer out tonight. Paul prayed prayers of thanksgiving. 
Now, Paul teaches us in other places that we are to be a thankful people, and Colossians is kind of the companion epistle to Ephesians because they were sister cities. I mean, Ephesus, Colossae, Laodicea, Hierapolis, those cities are all very close together in what was then called Asia. He writes to the church in Colossae, Colossians 3, verse 15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you were indeed called to one body, and be thankful. Paul said, be thankful. Ephesians 5.20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice Paul taught the church in Colossae and the church in Ephesus to be thankful. In fact, Paul takes it a step farther and says, giving thanks always, even in COVID-19. This is why we give thanks for our meals. This is why we give thanks for all of his provision. You know, I, I don't understand Christians that are not thankful. Maybe because some of us grew up without much, and we've lived decades of our life without much. And we look around now, and we, we see all that God has given us, and we just, thank you, Father. L look, at, look at what you've done for us. One of our members called me the other day, and they just bought their first car. And this is like a dream come true. Now, it's not brand new, it's, it, but it's new to them, all right? And he called me. He was sitting in the driver's seat of the car, and he said, Pastor, I'm sitting in my family's first car. He said, Pastor, I'm the first member of my family that has ever had a car. We all grew up so poor. Pastor, I am sitting in the driver's seat of our own car. And he said, Pastor, I don't know how to express how I feel right now. I said, I do. I said, your heart is bursting in thanksgiving. He said, yes, Pastor. He said, I got tears coming down my face. He said, I'm just sitting here. This is our car. I can take my family anywhere we want to go. It will be safe. No more getting on jeepneys. No, no more being worried about our, our bags being slit open. No, no more worried about COVID-19 on the public transportation. He said, Pastor, he said, I got tears. He was thankful. Always giving thanks for everything. Now, beloved, if you're going to be thankful, thankfulness needs to be expressed. All right? It's one thing to be thankful in your heart. It's another thing to actually say thank you. When somebody does something nice for you and they're in a physical body, you look at them and you say, Maraming salamat po. Salamat po. We always say thank you to a person. But beloved, look at what our Heavenly Father does for us every day. Look around your home right now. Everything you have, God gave you. Think of how God has provided for you during this COVID-19. Be thankful. Think, just, I mean, sit down and just think and learn. It's one thing to be grateful in your heart. It's another thing to say thank you to him. So Paul says in Ephesians 1 verse 16, he said, I do not cease to give thanks for you. Now he's talking about thanking for people remembering you in my prayers. So Paul is taking it even to another level. He's saying, listen, it's one thing to say thank you for what God has done for you. But he said, in your prayer, take your thankfulness a step farther. Begin to thank God for what he's done in other people's lives. I do not cease, verse 16, to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. It's one thing to be thankful in our personal life, for all the things God has done. But it, it almost seems unnatural to say thank you to God for what he did for somebody else. Because we think, well, he didn't do that for me. Well, he did it for another member of the body. <laughs> he did it for somebody that you love and that you supposedly care about. Now, here's a little key. If you and I would learn to be thankful to God and in our prayer life, thank God for what he did for other people. Thank God for that car he gave to that family. Thank God for that new house and lot he gave to this family. Thank God for that, that, that new blessing, that new promotion that God gave to your brother. 
If you and I would learn to be thanking God for what he did in other people's lives, you notice that there's no place for that little green-eyed monster of envy and jealousy. If we would learn to just be thankful to God, I never cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now take this a step farther. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. Paul said, And you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. English Standard Version. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Now look at that. He said, you pray for us. And as God grants us favor and as God blesses us in answer to your prayers, then other people will give thanks on our behalf. Wow. So we pray for the blessings of God upon people, and then we thank God for the blessings of God upon people. Wow. Now this is exactly what Paul did. Romans chapter 1, verse 8. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Philippians 1, verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as it is right. He said, hey, this is right. Giving thanks to God for other people, this is right. Because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you toward one another is increasing. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 4, I give thanks to you, my God, always. I give thanks to my God always for you. I give thanks to my God always for you. Because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Now look at this. Paul, Paul is not just thankful for their life. Paul is thankful for what God has done in their life. Now, let me just walk you through this just a little bit. First of all, the reason for his thankfulness. He said, I've heard about your faith, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. For this reason, because I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I've heard about your faith and your love toward all the saints. He said, I've heard about the love that you are showing other people. He said, I've, I've heard that God has grown your faith. I've heard that God has given you a heart of love for one another. Now, this is all God's work, folks. This is nothing that Paul is talking about is giving thanks to God for what we did in our own strength and our own flesh. He said, this is the grace that God has given you in Christ Jesus. He said, "I'm, I'm thanking God because these are the graces that have been released in your life. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 4. Secondly, the completeness of his thanksgiving. Verse 16, he said, I do not cease to give thanks to you. New International Word, I have not stopped giving thanks to you. Weiss translation, I do not cease giving thanks for you. I constantly make mention of you in my prayers. So the reason, look at what God has been doing in your life. Look at the grace that has flowed to your life, that has brought all these changes in your life. He said, I'm completely thankful. He said, I've I never stop saying thank you. Do you know how often I spend time thanking God for what he's done in your life? I just learned this from Paul. I sit back and I I look at you and I look at families and I remember where you've come from. And I remember marriages that have come back together. I remember businesses that God has rebuilt. I remember young people that have been restored to families. I love to come and say, Father, thank you. Look at what you've done in their lives. Father, I thank you for it. I thank you for what you've done. I thank you for how you, you've built their lives and built their... Paul said, this is something you, I never cease doing. Now, th- th- this is how we should be for one another. Parents, this is how you should be for your children. Young people, this is how you should be for your parents. All right, the reason, the completeness. But Now look at the focus. His focus was never on man. His focus was always on God. Now, these were people he had ministered to. And he didn't say, I thank God that when I came to you, I changed your life. (laughs) It had nothing to do with his ministry among these people, though he was their spiritual father. He wasn't giving thanks for anything he had done in their life. 
He was completely giving thanks for the grace of God that was being released in their life. So this was, this is not a selfish thing because he was their spiritual father. He was giving thanks. I thank you, God, that you allowed me to teach them this truth that changed their life. <laughs> there, there was none of that in Paul. He was just thanking the father. Father, I thank you for what you've done. Look at what you've done, Lord. Look at how you've given love to that husband and wife back to one another. Look at how the faithfulness that you have put back in the heart. God, only you can change a heart. Oh, Father, look at what you've done. Father, look at how you took that family out of discouragement. And you, you put your hope and you put your encouragement in their lives. And you've strengthened and now you're blessing the work of their hands. Lord, look at what you're doing in that family. This is the prayer life of Paul, his thankfulness. Now, a second thing Paul prayed for. He prayed for them to increase in the knowledge of God. Now, you've got to back up and understand. Paul would be one of the top people in the Bible that had a heart to know God. I mean, if you go study all the different people in the Bible, you've got Moses, who is... A, one day I'm going to preach a whole sermon on men and women who had a heart to know God because, you know, they're kind of rare in the, even in the Bible. Moses was one of those men. King David was one of those men. Paul was one of those men. And, you know, I sometimes wonder if Paul's heart to know God was partially motivated because he knew he missed an incredible opportunity in life. See, at salvation in Acts 9, verse 5, Paul cries out, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, do you know what that must have done to Paul? Paul obviously was a member of the Sanhedrin court because he stood as the official witness at the death of Deacon Stephen. He would have been there at the illegal trial of Jesus. He would have been there voting for Jesus' crucifixion. He would have been there discussing Jesus all through that three and a half years of his ministry. He would have been there when they were so angry in the Sanhedrin because Jesus had cleansed the temple not once but twice. I mean, Jesus was a regular discussion topic among the Sanhedrin for three and a half years. And Paul realized, I missed three and a half years of walking and talking with the Savior. So when he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, I believe some switch turned in Paul. And Paul thought, I'm never going to miss another opportunity. I'm never going to miss another opportunity to know the Savior. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He said, you know what? I don't, I don't care about being on the Sanhedrin. He said, I, I don't care about having a big name. He said, forgive me, all the, the stuff of this world. He said, it's meaningless. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. And he said, I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Oh, beloved, what a heart. Paul didn't care about anything except knowing Jesus and proclaiming him to the world. This, this was his heart. This is what drove him every day of his life. So if there is a man that I want to listen to about praying to know Jesus and praying to know God more, yeah, Paul's one of those top guys I want to listen to. Now listen to how he teaches us to pray. Ephesians 1, beginning with verse 17. And I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you, number one, the spirit of wisdom, and number two, and revelation, so that, for the purpose of, you may know him better. You may know him better. English Standard Version. 
and that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, how do you pray to know him more? I remember as a young youth pastor in Chicago, I didn't have a home to live in yet. Uh, I was just, I was what they call house sitting. Families that went on vacation, I would go stay in their house. And I remember there was an old song that was sung, I want to know you, to know you, Lord. And I would just sit in that little house and just sing that and sing that and sing that and sing that because I didn't understand these verses. Now, yes, I do believe that you can pray, God, I want to know you. I do believe that. But listen to how Paul teaches us to pray. He said, I pray that God will give you the spirit. And the word here is small s. It's not the, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's an attitude. An attitude of wisdom and an attitude of revelation that you may know him more. Now he said, listen, what we're praying for here is for you to have a heart to know God. Now, the knowledge of God surrounds us. I mean, please, we have his word. I mean, please, you, you realize you're sitting down. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. When you sit down with the word, you're sitting down with God. Okay? So you've got the word, but then you look at nature. Psalms chapter 19, verses 1 to 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun. Now notice, God said all of nature speaks of him. Every time I look at a flower, I can see something about God. Sister Bev has gotten into bird watching lately. I never knew my wife would ever like watching birds. But we live in a little condo on an 11th floor. And she, I bought her a set of binoculars for Valentine's Day. And she sits out there every evening around just before dark. And she gets out her little binoculars and she's watching all these birds. And she came in the other day and there was some yellow bird that had been out there. And she was so excited. She's seen a yellow bird. <laughs> I, was just, I just thought, I would have never believed it. My wife loves birds and now there's a yellow bird out there. Now, brothers and sisters, you can see God in the birds. When you look at the stars of the heavens, you see God. When you see the moon up there at night, it reveals things about God. When you look at the oceans, when you look at the fish, when you look at the dogs, all of creation speaks of God. Now notice he said, I want you to pray for an attitude of wisdom and an attitude of revelation. This is a mentality. God wants to give us, and this is the way we should pray, God give me a heart attitude to perceive and receive the knowledge of God. Ah, God, give me a heart's attitude that can perceive and receive the knowledge of God. This is why Isaiah says in Isaiah 6, verses 9 to 10, and Jesus quotes it and Paul quotes it. He, he said, you know, what is this? They have eyes that do not see and ears that do not hear down to this very day. Isaiah talks about it. Jeremiah talks about it in Jeremiah 5, 21. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 13. And as Paul writes the book of Romans 11, he's still quoting. He said, these people, they have eyes to see and ears that cannot hear. They don't have a mentality to receive. Paul understood how important it was to have this attitude of wisdom, this attitude of revelation, these attitudes of this mentality to know him. What Isaiah talks about with the eyes to see and ears to hear and Jesus talks about and Jeremiah talks about and he talks about in Romans. Paul understood this because for three and a half years as he walked the earth, Paul did not have a heart to know Jesus. Paul did not have eyes to see. Paul did not have a, an attitude of revelation and an attitude of, uh, of wisdom. He didn't have eyes to see. 
ears to hear, and a heart to understand. So Paul knows how important this is. Now, beloved, this is what Paul is saying. Do you want to know God more? Then it's not just a matter of praying, Oh, Father, I want to know you. Oh, Father, I want to know you. It's a matter of saying, Lord, give me a heart to know you. Give me a a heart's attitude to be able to perceive, to be able to receive, to be able to, to understand. Because, brothers and sisters, God's not like us. I mean, please forgive me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when I was a young man, I, I read this book about this guy up in Russia. And a boy walked up and asked him, what is Jesus like? And he said, like me. And I thought, oh, yes, Lord, that's what I want to be able to say. But you know what? That was many years ago when I was a very foolish young pastor. And in fact, I think I probably preached it here at COP in the early 80s. I have learned a lot since then. And maybe the greatest thing I've ever learned is he's nothing like me. He's nothing like you. He is so far beyond us. He is so much kinder, so much nicer, so much firmer, so much stricter. (laughs) Every attribute we have, he's so far beyond us. If you think that you're good, he's good to infinity and beyond, as the cartoon says. You think you're kind, he's kind to infinity and beyond. Brothers and sisters, we need a heart to perceive and receive and understand who he is and what he's like. No wonder Moses prayed, Lord, teach me your ways. No wonder we are taught in the Psalms, show me your ways that I may walk in them. Moses knew the ways of God. Israel only knew the acts of God. I don't ever want to be a Christian who just knows what God does. I want to, I want to understand his heart. I want, to, I want to understand what motivates him to do what he does. I want to know him. Now we're going to pick up there next Friday night. But as you can see, there's some very, very beautiful, beautiful things. Ephesians 1.18, having the eyes of your heart enlightened <laughs> because you can perceive, receive, and understand. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? All right, we're going to pick up there next Friday night. We'll have pastors calling you and texting you, giving you the latest information on what we're going to try to do for some type of services this week within the guidelines. So watch out for the text messages. Watch out or call or text your your campus pastors or your district pastors, and we'll, we'll be in touch with you. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow morning for morning devotion starting at 6. We'll see you then.